I'm Ron Nuremberg, San Antonio Mayor and member of Musical Bridges Around the World Global Advisory Council. Arts, culture, and heritage are the lifeblood of our great city, and it's my honor to welcome you to the opening of the 7th Annual International Music Festival. Musical Bridges is charged with the mission to transform lives through multicultural performing and visual arts by shattering barriers, creating connectivity, and inspiring hope for those with least access. We come to you virtually in a dynamic new format, featuring the world-renowned and award-winning performers you have come to know over the years. Today, we look back at a year where concerts across the globe were canceled. Artists sheltered and reimagined their role in society. We'll be hearing from leaders in philanthropy at the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C., as well as the chairman of the Ford Foundation, our very own San Antonian, Dr. Francisco Cigarroa. The CEO of Sphinx Organization will join us from Detroit to address the challenges of equity and diversity in the arts. We're also thrilled to welcome Music Director Emeritus of the San Antonio Symphony, Maestro Sebastian Lang Lessing, joined by a singer and musicians we have grown to love over the years of their performances with Musical Bridges. We invite you to engage and join in the conversation during our live panels and stay connected for thought-provoking and inspiring sessions throughout the afternoon. Thank you for joining us as we reflect, reset, and revive. Now, over to Suhail Arastu for our first panel, Arts, Leadership, and Vision for a Post-Pandemic Future. Thank you, Mayor Nuremberg, for taking the time to open our seventh annual International Music Festival and first virtual summit. We know you value the place of arts and culture in our community as a former general manager of San Antonio's jazz station, KRTU. Our city is also home to a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is a city of creative gastronomy. Happy Fiesta and welcome to our viewers across the city, state, nation, and globe. Stay tuned through the end of today's program when Musical Bridges founder and artistic director Anya Grakowski will announce the winners of our raffle prizes, which include Fiesta medals and MBAW signature mugs. There's still time to enter the raffle by registering for a ticket on Eventbrite if you have not already done so. Today we begin by looking at arts in the pandemic era and the resilience of organizations as we look to the future. We invite you to engage our panelists by entering your questions, comments, and reflections just below the video window. We begin by welcoming from the nation's capital, Sunil Iyengar. Director of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts, an agency that is also a sponsor of this summit. Under his leadership, the office has established data partnerships with the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, as well as a system map, National Repository for the Arts, and two award programs for arts research. Working with partners such as the National Institutes of Health, Kennedy Center, Brookings Institute, and the National Academy of Sciences and American Medical Colleges, Sunil has worked to explore arts as they relate to well-being, economic development, STEM, and medicine. A poet, editor, and reporter, he's working as an analyst and also writes Taking Note, the NEA's official blog. I think we all understand innately the importance of the arts, but Sunil, you've studied and published the numbers through data-driven research. So as a young country, sometimes here in the U.S., we, we take arts for granted and see it as entertainment or discretionary or value-added. But your research demonstrates the critical role of arts in society, from learning to healing and innovation. So we're thrilled that you've taken the time to join us. So we'd like to hear why you do what you do and how you came to your role at the National Endowment for the Arts. Welcome, Thank Sunil. you. Thank you, Suhail. Um, great to be here, and I want to give a shout out uh, to, to, in San Antonio anyway, to uh, an NEA research lab we're very proud to fund at the University of Texas San Antonio, which is studying at this moment uh, arts incubators in the U.S. and how they connect to broader entrepreneurship and innovation in society. As that example indicates, um, you know, what I do in this job as a director of research at the NEA is um, coordinate studies and programs where we truly try to bring evidence to bear on how the arts are, are, uh, are sustained throughout the US and to build evidence and promote knowledge. As you suggested, Suhail, a lot of people don't necessarily equate the arts with very tangible benefits, whether it's economic, social, civic, emotional, social, and there's so many ways we can study this. And so we try to support that through our federal partners 
but also through grant programs in, dedicated to research. And uh, I would love to, you know, maybe we can explore some of this in the discussion, but clearly there are a lot of research questions that have been raised in light of the world we're in right now in terms of pandemic, post-pandemic, hopefully, um, and other, you know, kind of issues around the world and in this country, particularly um, having to do with uh, the sustainability, as I said, of the arts sector as a whole. So we do hope to uh, devote more time to that in the coming uh, months and years. I did want to quickly note, though, that, um, uh, you know, we are all at the NEA, if those of you want to know, in Washington, D.C., many of us are still working from home, uh, but it's a very much all hands on deck mode as we strive to bring out uh, funding to support that come, came from the American Rescue Plan. We're very grateful to be able to administer about $135 million in grants across the country. And so we're working on that. We're working to develop application guidelines and so forth right now to benefit arts organizations that are most in need at this present time. So thank you for uh, including me and great to be here. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks, Sunil. Next, joining us from Detroit, Michigan, is the president and artistic director of Sphinx, an organization that transforms lives through the power of diversity in the arts. A recipient of Kennedy Center's Human Spirit Award, as well as one of Musical America's top 30 influencers, Afa Dvorkin is a musical thought leader and cross-sector strategist driving national programming that promotes diversity in classical music. Born in Moscow and raised in Azerbaijan, she is a violinist who has traveled globally as a performer, but now serves as a lecturer at University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, as well as adjunct faculty at Roosevelt University teaching arts administration. Last year, Afa joined us in San Antonio as a member of the Gerwitz International Piano Competition Jury, and we're grateful to have her here with us today. Welcome, Afa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it, it is a pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually. I think of my time in San Antonio with great fondness. Um, it's such an artistically oriented community. And um, it was just a, a real honor and a pleasure to be a part of um, the events surrounding the performance competition and get to know the artistic and the philanthropic community of this. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm, I head up the Sphinx organization, and Sphinx is an organization that's a bit unique in not only its mission, but also the manner in which it operates. Um, we have been around for almost 25 years, and it's an organization that works to advance diversity in the performing arts with an emphasis on classical music. Um, the impetus behind Sphinx and its founding was really to um, do the work so that really the performing arts and particularly classical music can work toward becoming reflective of the rich diversity that's inherent in our communities um, so that the field can, can really benefit from that great diversity that already exists in the communities where we reside. Um, more than 25 years ago, just before Sphinx was founded, for example, American orchestras um, uh, compri were comprised of about one and a half percent of, of people of color, specifically Black and Latinx, as opposed to a greater degree of representation in the population. 25 years later, we're at about four and a half percent. So there has been growth, but not nearly enough. So um, there's, because of that, Sphinx has kind of centered all of its efforts um, in the area of creative youth development to really spark that participation and interest and, and, and really uh, nurturing of the talent within minorities and communities of color, onward to professional development, to then participation in music schools and conservatories, American orchestras, and then, and as well as on stage and behind stage on leadership seats and now in boardrooms. Um, Sphinx reaches about 10,000 people through its overall programming normally and about two and a half million through its audiences. Of course, during the pandemic, we've had to recenter ourselves a bit and reimagine the work that we do. Um, like most everyone else in our field, we are working remotely and that wasn't nearly as much of a shock as it was to really learn and, and understand and fully internalize the manner in which the pandemic has really affected the livelihoods of our artists. So Sphinx very much pivoted fairly immediately into the sphere of um, really taking its resources and distributing those resources to our artists. Overall, um, Sphinx grants nearly a million dollars to its artists 
um, annually through a variety of different scholarship, artist grant programs, and other initiatives that are all designed to not only advance careers of Black and Brown artists, but also um, to center, invest in, and advance innovation and creative solutions in the sphere of performing arts. And, and really cluster-like programs that, that makes a, a systemic difference in our field. Um, so this year we've had to really double down in that area and really um, find ways to not only reinvigorate this activity amongst artists, but really also show them that uh, with the understanding that particularly artists of color and communities of color have been so disproportionately affected by the pandemic that we've really had to center our work surrounding that um, so as not to lose the great momentum that was there uh, with our programming before. Um, I will also say that we've seen a great deal of creativity creativity come from our artists, all of whom have had to reimagine their own role in society and really find other ways through which they, they've been using their voices. And that is uh, be it through uh, written advocacy, um, creation of new works and compositions, and really finding other ways through which they're giving back to their own communities and the community of emerging artists who are coming after them. So to see that um, ongoing energy and resilience from our artists has been really um, incredible. And um, of course, ourselves, we find that um, although it's a forced sort of a setting, really the use of innovation and technology has also allowed us to greatly expand um, our own presence and impact uh, this year. In fact, increasing our presence around the world to about 66 million um, through viewership, um, use, user based. Um, participation and engagement. And that's really been rewarding um, and really a wonderful lesson for all of us at Sphinx. Wow, I think I heard you say 66 million. That's an incredible expansion in viewership. Well, thank you for joining us here, Afa. Now, to all of our viewers earlier, you heard Mayor Nuremberg mention that we had Dr. Francisco Cigueroa, chairman of the Ford Foundation, scheduled to join us. Well, Dr. Cigueroa is also a pediatric transplant surgeon, and he had a kid that needed an organ this afternoon, so he had to run to the operating room. Very graciously, his good friend, Tullus Wells, is able to share this hour with us. Tullus has served as managing director of the Kronkowski Charitable Foundation since November of 2014. He formerly was a partner in the San Antonio office of Bracewell LLP, an international law firm, where he, among other roles, served as a general counsel for the NBA San Antonio Spurs. He has held various civic and charitable posts during his career, including serving for 15 years as the Honorary Consul General for Canada in San Antonio, and as Chairman of the Greater San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, the Free Trade Alliance, and the World Affairs Council. We should mention that Kronkowski is an operational sponsor of musical bridges around the world. Now tell us, how did you come to do what you're doing and what has the role of the foundation been during this pandemic? And then how do you see it evolving as we move forward? Well, so Hale, thank you very much for uh, having me today. I, I must say in the small world syndrome, as you mentioned, Dr. Cigarro and I have been close friends for decades. Um, and his colleague, Darren Walker, whom many of you may know as CEO of the Ford Foundation, um, uh, succeeded me by just a couple of years uh, as president of a uh, organization at the University of Texas. So we've all known each other way too long. Uh, I'm flattered to be here. Um, let me say initially though, uh, how important Musical Bridges is. This is a unpaid advertisement. Um, what they do, what you guys do here for this community is remarkable. I'll touch on that uh, more specifically in a bit, but um, uh, you folks are really important to the infrastructure, um, arts and culture infrastructure of our community. Um, when I came to Kronkowski, I came as Suhail mentioned from a checkered past as a lawyer and uh, uh, involvement in, in other things for the past 40 years. I recall I was given a speech in Grand Rapids a couple of years ago, and I started off with uh, the audience, what's the difference between charity and philanthropy? And after some pause, someone raised their hand and said, well, at least I can spell charity. And so that was sort of my early uh, thoughts about making sure we understand that distinction. The reason I raised it here um, with respect to the question raised by Suhail is because what Kronkowski does is philanthropy. We're the largest private foundation in the greater San Antonio area. 
uh, have been for a long, long time. We invest about $20 million a year in the greater San Antonio area. We are restricted to several uh, specific counties. But in terms of that investment we make year to year, we spend about 20% of our dollars, 19% and change over the last 30 years in arts and culture. And the reason we do that, and the reason that I have been pretty bullish about keeping us on that path and growing us on that path is because what I've seen is um, the good work that arts and culture organizations do, not just for the audiences they serve, but for the outreach they do and the way they stitch together the fabric of our community. San Antonio is a relatively poor city. Um, we have a number of uh, school districts that are in Title I and need additional assistance. And Musical Bridges and other organizations like you do a wonderful job as basically fulfilling a social services role because the outreach that is done, uh, the inclusiveness uh, of the audiences from around the entire community, that is a compelling factor with me as we decide uh, where to make our investments. Um, a lot of money traditionally, as you know, has gone to what I very politely refer to as the SOBs, you know, the major performing arts organizations, symphony, opera, and ballet. And we have a terrific symphony, opera, and ballet in San Antonio. But musical bridges and others like that have a much more robust outreach program sometimes than the major performing arts organizations have. All of those here are pretty good corporate citizens. But what we look for in philanthropy, particularly in a pandemic is who's able to continue to reach out to our very diverse community and make sure that we continue to stitch this community together in a time where it is very, very difficult as all of you know, to have everybody on the same page or at least thinking about the same things and talking about how to make our community better. So when I think of philanthropy in the context of the pandemic here in San Antonio, at least, uh, it's about that role that when I've spoken to licensing organizations for museums or otherwise, I always start with, they're a great arts organization, but they're an even better social services organization. And that's what we at Kronkowski um, keep trying to encourage. And that's what we decide we're going to fund because we want to invest our dollars uh, as wisely as we can. So thanks again for having me today. That's right. Thank you, Tullus, for joining us. And so I'd like to kind of begin the conversation. All of you are with granting organizations, as Alpha mentioned, a million dollars a year goes to artists. They do actively program as well. And in Sunil's case, with the National Endowment for the Arts, the organization supports the arts exclusively. With Kronkowski, the arts are supported, and TELUS has already spoken to this question, but Sphinx is very targeted and how they grant artists. So our audience, we may have artists and organizations that wonder how these granting decisions are made, and even if artists or organizations are aligned with your mission, what is the deciding factor, and how can entities best go about partnering with you? So I'll, maybe we'll begin with Sunil. Okay, sure, thank you very much. This reminds me that uh, we are actually very much in the thick, the NEA is in the thick of developing a new strategic plan to guide our next four years. Uh, this will affect our grant making operations, everything else we do. And so uh, we just went out for a call for public comments, a very early call because we haven't developed the plan yet. Um, and we're analyzing the feedback and now we'll be uh, drafting a plan to put forward to the public for their input. So it is very much a, an opportunity to uh, to get involved with the NEA and to learn about what we do and see how, if you have any comments to how we could do our work better on behalf of the American people. Um, the, so the grant making processes within the National Endowment for the Arts, as I suspect is true for many other kinds of funders, public funders. In our case, we have uh, what are called citizen expert panels where uh, basically reviewers who we you know, choose uh, from a variety of different uh, backgrounds, racial, ethnic, gender, and um, and also their own knowledge base and expertise. They can be lay panelists or they can be experts in quotes across various artistic disciplines. So we have close to, I think about close to a dozen different 
artistic disciplines that you can come in the door with and a grant application for, uh, ranging from all the you know various art forms, of course, music, um, theater, dance, et cetera, media arts, uh, arts education, and a really interesting one that might be of value to this group, particularly design and creative placemaking. Uh, and I mentioned that one because I think that particular program, which we call Our Town, is uh, emblematic, that grants program, of, um, of, of, of our, our opportunities for people to come in from different backgrounds as applicants. So you don't it's true that we fund uh, predominantly arts-focused organizations, but there are actually a lot of organizations who receive NEA funding that are, don't have the arts directly in their mission, but are partnering with artists or arts organizations to make work happen. Uh, bringing a different skill set or uh, area of expertise. These could be social service organizations more broadly. These could be, um, you know, certainly uh, educational groups, um, tribal communities, of course, uh, rural communities, all kinds of com people from all kinds of communities, but also different types of organizations. Um, you have to be a, one of various within various categories of eligibility in terms of being a 501c3 nonprofit or a tribal community or a school various other uh, qualifications. But the point is you don't necessarily have to have an arts focused mission as an organization. And so I mentioned the Our Town program because its, it's focus is what we call creative placemaking. It's, it's, it's essentially use, integrating the arts with planning, collective action on behalf of the community. And oftentimes it brings the artists to the table with the designers, you know, sorry, with, um, with city planners, with economic development offices, with other groups in the community, to, and of course with the residents to uh, infuse the arts into that community and to sustain it through, uh, through, um, through ongoing funding and support. So those are some of the thing, opportunities to collaborate and, and we always are welcoming partners through our grantees. So if you're a grant applicant, we ask that we offer some, some of our programs like Our Town require you to partner with a certain type of organization uh, we had the, my office has the research grants and we have several academic research applicants, universities, colleges, and so on, who choose to partner with an arts organization uh, to get the job done. We also have arts organizations who come in for research grants who partner with a non-arts organization oftentimes to, to do some work that has a broader impact. So I think one of the things, just to, to cap off the way our grants are reviewed, so we, we essentially convene these different panels of experts and you know, citizens across the country to review these applications. And it's, it's really democracy at work um, because there's, you know, they essentially score these applications, they discuss them, they rate them, and you have different views that are articulated in the comments by the, by the panelists. Um, but what's great here is, um, you know, what we, what we tend to rely upon are criteria of excellence and merit, artistic excellence and artistic merit. But oftentimes those categories are fairly expansive. So when we talk about merit, oftentimes what we're looking for, and we state this in our guidelines, is the impact and the beneficiaries of the project. So describing what, how is this, how's the artistic project or the work, or in my case, research going to be used? What are your distribution plans? You know, who, which communities are you engaging with? And all that is reviewed as part of the application. So it's no longer, it's not just a work in isolation. It's also perhaps the reach of that work and how it's going to benefit a broader uh, group. I hope that's somewhat helpful, but um, that's that's in a nutshell how we do a lot of our grant making. And as I say, right now, we're in the process of planning uh, to administer this sort of bolus of funds we got for uh, from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, so that will have a slightly different process, but the same principles of excellence and merit will apply. Excellent. Well, I'm sure the nation looks forward to what comes out of the next strategic plan, but hearing this cross-disciplinary approach, it's so great because, as Tullus mentioned, the arts are the fabric that stitch our communities together. And one of the things I didn't mention in your introduction is a great initiative where I saw you recently working with Sanjay Gupta from CNN and Renee Fleming, the famed soprano with the Sound Health Network. And for those yeah. of our viewers that want to check that out, that's a really great example of looking at the impact of music on healing, music on medicine. And in fact, if you stay tuned for our later panel, well, you'll hear a lot about that from our moderator, Dr. May Ray. So if I may, I just wanted yeah. to quickly thank you for that opening. I was looking for a place to talk about this uh, because we are, of course, at Musical Bridges. And um, just in a nutshell, we are working with, uh, we've been working for a few years now with National Institutes of Health and Renee Fleming, of course, the soprano and 
very knowledgeable, almost, I would consider her an expert now in, in understanding neuroscience of music and healing related to music, uh, the research behind it, I should say, um, and also the Kennedy Center uh, in DC. And we've, we've formed a partnership called the Sound Health Initiative. And the most recent offshoot of that, and there was a launch event, as you mentioned, Suhail, uh, for this initiative called the Sound Health Network, which I'd urge you to go look up. Um, we have a, it's basically a national clearinghouse and resource center for research and for, to connect researchers and practitioners who study music, healing, and the brain. And um, it's, it's based out of, uh, it's a partnership with the NEA and the University of California, San Francisco. So I highly advocate people to, to go check, check it out. Um, we hope, you know, that's going to be a place, a repository of new research in the space and also we'll and today, I believe they're having a webinar, if not today or tomorrow, uh, on population health and music. And so they're examining various dimensions of music and bringing that to a broader public. And we hope that'll have effects for music education and arts education more broadly in this country as well. Personally, I find it absolutely fascinating. My background is actually in neuroscience, Sunil. I don't know if I told you that, but uh, what you guys are doing is incredible. And I think it speaks to certainly one of our programs at Musical Bridges, where we take music to senior citizens in retirement communities and senior centers where they're not able to always travel to live performing arts in our Tobin Center or our Empire Theater and bringing the music directly to them. And the response is just so profound, the memories that it evokes and the things that people are able to recall. Sometimes when memory goes with Alzheimer's, the thing that stays is the ability to play and perform music. We see that all the time. And so that's, it's, it's really great work, and we do encourage our viewers to check that out, Sound Health Network. So AFA with Sphinx Organization, you know, you talked about the importance of bringing underrepresented populations, including uh, brown and black populations, the Latin and African American in our, in our community, into the classical music world. That doesn't seem to your, be your background, I don't think, but um, tell us, you know, how artist organizations can partner and how do they become part of Sphinx and how has that become the mission? Sure. So you're right. It is not directly my background, but I, um, I'm fortunate to have been raised abroad and been a, a direct beneficiary of really wonderful, excellent, well-rounded music education. And for all of the faults of the society in which I was raised in former Soviet Union, um, one thing was really clear, the arts and performing arts in particular were prioritized as something that was just a, a very necessary prerequisite for any emerging citizen to have in their arsenal. So the, the concept of STEAM, although not articulate in such a way, was, was just something that was accessible to anyone without regard to zip code or skin tone or heritage. So as such, coming into the States and not seeing that, not seeing um, uh, classical music or the performing arts being part of a young person's development in a way that is accessible, that is equitable and thoughtful was just fairly jarring. And then I was, um, I was fortunate to come across what was to become Sphinx as a concept through an introduction of my then classmate, uh, an African-American violinist, um, Aaron Dworkin, who was to become my, my life partner much, much later. But that idea of, of really creating a balance or reciprocity between the performing arts and the communities in which they reside and or which they serve, that, that is what was really um, just fascinating to me. And I, you know, I became involved as an intern, um, as a trained violinist, I never envisioned I would end up kind of in this administrative sort of a role, but it became my life's work because really I found myself to be embraced um, by the community. And I found the work to be incredibly meaningful and rewarding and so aligned with my own kind of beliefs relative to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and, and how, how integrative um, that is with the arts and the manner in which they serve as a vehicle for a young person's um, expression and their development. Um, so in terms of how to, um, so I've been with Sphinx for the past 25 years, and over the course of those 25 years, Sphinx has really reimagined and reshaped itself in a variety of different ways. And then once again, about a year ago, with the onset, uh, onset of the pandemic, we've really kind of delved into um, this process of finding ourselves as a player 
uh, and the fabric of the performing arts, really from the standpoint of not just being an operational organization, but also grant giving and almost a de facto service to the field organization, because a lot of what we do is amass resources and distribute them inward with an artist centric approach. So there are so many ways to get involved with Sphinx. First, we partner with more than 200 arts institutions and educational institutions across the world. Um, and that includes about 105 orchestras. So um, if you are representative of an, of an orchestra, then there's a way to get involved with Sphinx. Um, we have this National Alliance for Audition Support um, that serves hundreds of emerging black and brown orchestral musicians who are trying to build a career toward placement and, um, and really um, a career in uh, uh, an orchestral stage. So, so really it's, it's a comprehensive approach to kind of system build approach to not only grant giving, but also career development. So there, there's that. Sphinx also does a great deal of regranting. Um, we work with other institutions as well as individuals who um, entrust us with resources for us to then figure out a process of assessing, adjudicating and distributing the resources directly back to our artists, which ranges from career grants to some of the COVID relief funds that we've um, distributed significantly in this past year, as well as uh, a variety of different awards programs, such as the Sphinx Medal of Excellence that awards $50,000 grants to three top um, emerging black and brown classical artists who are really making a huge difference on stage. Um, and a variety of other programs. So really as an individual or another foundation or corporation um, to get involved with Sphinx, it, was, it is really to enter into a partnership because one thing that Sphinx does have access to is a, is a community of about 900 alumni and, and incredible artists who are leading the way through their own careers, through their innovation, um, both off and on stage and as ambassadors into the community. So the ways, the many ways in which we kind of structure our grant programs really infuse the resources back into the community and put dollars in the hands of our artists who are um, really leading through innovation. And, and as such, Sphinx is always open to and is welcoming of new friends and new partners who will do this work with us, um, both through direct financial resources as well as through ideas and other programmatic alliances and, and partnerships. And I think the last thing I'll say is that in the last couple of years and maybe more so in the last year, we've really invested into, into arts administration as well as entrepreneurship. Uh, which is relatively new for Sphinx, since a lot of the work we've done previously was really focused on our artists. Um, and that is because less than 2% of C-suite leaders in our field um, is represented by people of color. So really, um, we have a competitive program that um, establishes a cohort of 10 C-suite or executive level um, uh, driven leaders in the, in the field who are selected competitively each year for a two-year participation program. It's a fully funded program for them um, where they're paired with a mentor and where, where they undergo um, an intensive curriculum um, that covers everything from fundraising to public speaking to, to artistic programming and community engagement and beyond. Um, and, and similarly too, we invest into cultural entrepreneurs who are making a difference in the sphere of diversity and themselves represent kind of um, innovation and that out of the box thinking that is so necessary for our field to not only survive but thrive today. Well, thank you, Afa. I've had the fortune of attending three Sphinx Connect programs now, two in person and one virtually. And I'm it's so inspiring to see how engaging and competitive you make things like Sphinx Tank and opportunities. And it goes so much more beyond the music. It's about it's about life, it's about education, it's uh, it's overall. And so I think that was some really great insight and opportunities people may have to to partner with you. So thank you. So Hale, and can in I his I, opening? I, I, Yes. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Talos will say something. I, I just wanted to. I, one thing I, I forgot to mention, and it would probably be worth noting, noting for, for you all. Um, you know, a major partner for the National Endowment for the Arts historically has been the state arts agencies, and the territories and the various jurisdictions that have arts councils in this country. So um, you know, they can be a terrific partner for you all as well. Um, you know, about 40% of our funding 
and this is inclusive of the new funding uh, post COVID, the COVID relief funding goes to state arts agencies um, who really get the money out in very creative ways um, and useful ways to, across the country and, and reach underserved, uh, historically underserved populations along with our direct grants. So I just wanted, I didn't want that to be lost on anyone. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you, that's right. And so for those in Texas, we should mention there's the Texas Commission on the Arts, which is a partner of ours at Musical Bridges and many arts agencies here in our community. So tell us really kind of spoke to the investment of the Kronkowski Foundation and how that works in our San Antonio and surrounding area. But I, so I want to change direction here and take one of our questions from the audience for Tullis and ask what it will take for us as a nation to recognize the inherent value of arts and the role of arts in society. Because Tullis, you mentioned that arts is that fabric, uh, but what will it take for that universal recognition? If I had the answer to that, I would uh, be retired and uh, traveling the world uh, on my ill-gotten gains for figuring that out. Let me say initially, uh, follow up to my colleagues, then I'll answer the question. One of the things that Kronkowski decided at its inception 30 years ago was our mission would be to effect change that was measurable among other criteria. And so, the question you raised, Sunhil, and the comments made by my colleagues, one of the things we decided early on is we have a very robust research process and program. And when I go and we make decisions about spending money on arts and culture, and particularly in a pandemic where the community as a whole sort of rose up and said, we don't have money for arts or we don't have money for these other things, you know, every dollar needs to go into the sustainability of, you know, food, clothing, shelter, energy. And a lot of foundations were pushed very hard on that and justifiably so. What we at Kronkowski decided was it is equally important to sustain, again, that fabric of the community. And we could not let this pandemic wipe out not, a, not just the major performing arts organizations, but in fact, all of the organizations which may not be very old or may not be terribly uh, large, but it's really important to sustain those in our community. So our research function goes into showing that in fact, and I work closely in particular with the Tobin Endowment and the Tobin, Tobin Theater. Their, their CEO, Bruce Bug, is a longtime devotee uh, of the arts here. And he and I worked together on the notion that we, we are going to make sure that we sustain those organizations because we can empirically show that kids do better in school. We can empirically show that poor communities, education and safety and the other things that are so scalding to a poor community in a pandemic, those issues are lessened if they continue to have access to arts and cultural education and program. It is verifiable, you can see it in black and white. And I don't think we generally do enough of that, just making the case with research and hard data. Uh, I think that's the answer to the viewer's question is, we have to have that kind of information from reliable sources that we can take to the community and say, I know people have to eat and I know people have to have shelter, but if they don't have the other things that make our community stand out and make our community work, then the food and the shelter and the heat isn't gonna take us where we need to go. So we have been and will continue to be very bullish about making the case that uh, arts and cultural and entertainment, whatever you wanna call it, those things that move the soul are gonna be as important as those things that feed the stomach. And that's an important part of what we do. And I think it's an increasingly important part of what many major foundations do around the country. I, I so appreciate you sharing that, Tullis, because it was true, not just for us at Musical Bridges, but I'm sure many organizations, their philanthropies and foundations and supporters were told that, yes, we have redirected our efforts towards social services and food insecurity, and nobody's going to deny the importance of that. But artists and arts organizations also have 
bills and mouths to feed and, and shelter to provide. So the fact uh, that Kronkowski's taken a stand, and, and I should also mention, just because I know Francisco, our, our dear friend, wasn't able to join us today, but the Ford Foundation, we had a wonderful conversation with Darren Walker, and he really led the charge globally in terms of a lot of philanthropies saying that we're going to double down in this time and we're going to give away more than we have ever given before. And that's because just exactly as you said, that if we don't give to the organizations now, there won't be someone to give to when this is all over. So they made that very conscious decision to in fact increase their philanthropy to arts and other organizations. So uh, really, really appreciate you, you sharing that. Tell us now, We'd like to, we've got about close to 10 minutes left here, and uh, we have a question about virtual programming that's popped up here, and I think we'll be able to address that in one of our other panels, because though AFA is part of a virtual programming which thinks and has done some incredible jobs with their competition, uh, I want to stick to kind of what you envision as an organization. So you're doing the work that you do now, you did what you did before the pandemic, and what do you see moving forward in terms of philanthropy, your goals, your ideals, and maybe what the reality is. Uh, where would you like to see your, your organization as a, as a foundation, uh, the difference that it's making, and would you like less to do, or do you see having yourselves as a greater role in supporting the arts and culture? So uh, we'll, we'll start with Sunil. Well, um, I think what we have an opportunity to do, in addition to um, recovering from the pandemic and helping the sector to recover through funding, is maybe take some leadership in helping to find best practices and ways to uh, be more resilient as arts organizations. So getting back to uh, what Tullis was saying was music to my ears, as you can imagine, in, as a research director uh, for the NEA, um, you know, using empirical data to help support best practices. We released a report earlier this year called The Art of Reopening, which uh, hopes to give some tips based on interviews and surveys of arts organizations that successfully have reopened to understand uh, ways in which, speaking of virtual engagement, ways they can balance virtual engagement with in-person attendance, in-person events, safety precautions, of course, that they need to take, but also recognizing this is an opportunity to really, uh, to use your term, double down in, on, in communities and to really be much more local in approaches. Because I think one of the things we know, of course, in this world now, maybe there's less traveling, there's gonna be Maybe tourism isn't as much of the draw for some of these arts centers. And so to really look, look to their communities and engage them more deeply and extensively and maybe reach groups that have not been hitherto brought in as much through that outreach and engaging the community members as true partners in supporting the arts. And what that the opportunity is funders now is not only to you know, develop research that will support those kinds of practices, but also um, more broadly, um, we, we're pleased to be able to respond to the president's executive order on equity and underserved communities and to really look at how we assess our own approach as an agency toward equity, but also look at how we can uh, bring that to bear in everything we do. Um, that's really core to our mission. In fact, if you go back to the founding legislation of the National Endowment for the Arts, there's all kinds of language in there about uh, serving populations, uh, historically under, you know, uh, disadvantaged populations across the country. And we do that through our work as it, as it happens. Uh, we support grants all around the country in every type of community all, and, and all kinds of arts. But I think we want to be more intentional about that work and our strategic planning process, of course, will give us a tool to do that. Um, so I think we have a lot of opportunities both in equity and in resilient, economic resilience and recovery uh, from the arts sector and looking to support that through, through um, research, but also of course, grant making and practice. Great. Thank you, Sunil. And how about you, Afa? Where do you see Sphinx? Yeah, I, I think one of the most important um, roles that Sphinx sees itself playing, particularly from here to moving forward, is really um, as an advocacy organization and one that does its work or achieves its mission for the greater of the community, not only through its work, but also um, through direct example, which others can follow. One of the things I have encouraged many colleagues, leaders of various arts institutions to think about is kind of these, the, the, you know, kind of one first concept being that 
we ought to really think of ourselves, um, whether we're a conventional foundation, corporation, corporate foundation or individual, or an orchestra or a presenting house, we should all think of ourselves as philanthropic institutions and even better as investors. Um, I say this because we all, um, we all expend dollars on that which we find most important. We do so to survive and to sustain ourselves and to fulfill our mission. So where we invest our dollars is what matters. So in the wake of kind of the twin pandemics of the last year, and not only COVID, but obviously um, the, the yet far from resolved uh, national reckoning on race and equity um, and, and really working toward a more just society, particularly on the day like today, I'm thinking about um, how much it matters, how we expend our hard earned dollars and think about doing that as a means of investing in that, what we, that, in, in that which we find most important. So, you know, about a year ago when um, there was the news of George Floyd, our call to action was for all orchestras and presenting houses to dedicate a minimum of 15% of their operating dollars toward issues related to um, you know, non-white artists, issues related to DEI work, and and really dedicate 30 to 50 percent of their programming, which again is dollars invested. That is also philanthropy. That is also investment um, to again decentering whiteness and and working on ways um, to insist that our programming be reflective of the voices with which we're enriched, the voices of our community. And today, looking back a year, kind of I see Sphinx as that organization that not only does that work directly, but encourages others to do that as well. Because without that specific commitment to accountability will be nowhere. I don't want a year to pass and us reflect upon, wow, well, I mean, a year later, what we've done is maybe assembled a couple of task forces and engaged a couple of panels of diverse leaders and call it a day. Nobody cares about that. People care about what will be on stage and behind stage and what will our field look like? What will it feel like and who it will be led by? So the only way there will be a difference is through that direct work. And I mean, the old adage of budgets being moral documents, I see Sphinx as kind of as an organization that needs to insist on its partner sister organizations across the world doing the work in a way that is tangible, measurable, um, achievable, and driven by accountability. And that piece is, I think, um, is something that I think is really central and important to the way in which Sphinx is trying to fulfill its role in the fabric of the performing arts. Beautifully me, stated. Uh, Thank you. Let, and let uh, me, on to tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me give a, um, an atta girl to uh, Alpha and an atta boy to Sunil. I'll tell you why. Um, that is so important. Uh, one of the things that we decided um, when I came here several years ago. Uh, Krinkowski itself is a more diverse organization than it was previously. Um, our very good partners at Bank of America, who basically own the trust that established this foundation, we met with them again recently with respect to the investment on our asset and to make sure they understood our the importance of diversity in who's managing our money, uh, uh, the kinds of investments we're making as it relates to global warming and those kinds of issues. I mean, that, that's the way organizations with money can affect changes around the world. And we certainly do so with respect to the local arts organizations. I mean, the city of San Antonio has a very robust uh, local organization in the community that the city runs about giving money out to various categories of need in the community. But we've been pretty bullish with our friends at the city and at the county about making sure, again, in a pandemic, um, it was important to double down, maybe be more targeted, which I think they were, and we were be more thoughtful about what things need to look like two, three, four years out from now, based on the decisions we made today as to you know, what can be sustained and who can be sustained. But I, I too am a big believer that if we don't do this right, um, there's a lot of kids in Edgewood School District in San Antonio who have access to art and culture and music and other things 
And those kids will be less likely to be abused. They will be more likely to stay in school and they will be more successful in school um, because of the arts organizations that we decide to continue to support. It's a very mercenary way and some uh, would look at it so, and that's okay with us because we intend to let everybody know we're gonna make sure all of this community can be sustained um, through the downturn economically and in this pandemic. That's the end of my sermon. I love that, Tullus. And we, what we've talked about is the investment, is making that investment in the community and showing arts is, as an economic driver, as a healing tool. And I can't thank our panelists enough for joining us. Sunil Iyengar from the Director of Analysis and Research at the National Endowment for the Arts, Afa Dvorkin at the Sphinx Organization, the Artistic Director and CEO, and Tullis Wells joining us as Managing Director from the Kronkowski Foundation and kindly stepping in for Francisco Cigaroa. We appreciate all three of you have taking the time out of your afternoon, and we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you, Jael. So now, having heard about the importance of adding arts to STEM learning, we take a quick look at Musical Sprouts, an initiative launched by musical bridges around the world. We all learn in different ways, and while a mathematical equation or a physics formula may not resonate with a child on the black and white page of a textbook, witnessing math through rhythm and physics through airflow of an instrument may be far more tangible. The original educational engagement program, Kids to Concerts, was launched 23 years ago as a response to the dearth of liberal arts education in underserved San Antonio, San Antonio area schools, many of which Tullis just mentioned. We'll enjoy a segment of this program with Journey to Japan as we close out the festival later this afternoon. But let's look now at the impact of arts integration into core curricula learning with Musical Sprouts. Many of our kids have never been exposed to anything other than Divine Texas. And as great as Divine is, as good a place it is to live, it doesn't have, it doesn't show these kids what they need to know to be successful in the world. They need other experiences. That is what Musical Bridges brings to our kids. This whole little area is uh, predominantly Hispanic. And so economically disadvantaged here at Price Elementary, we're 98%. We have the demographics of students who are economically disadvantaged, over 60%, but then we also have students who are coming from various other backgrounds, higher socioeconomic status. But within each of those groups is a cultural melting pot of over 23 languages spoken at home here. Whenever I teach a lot of my kids, they ask me, where am I gonna use this? Why am I learning it? With Musical Sprouts, I am teaching them math, I'm teaching them science, I'm teaching them all different, straight across four different subjects and relating it to real world. Musical Sprouts last year changed our school for the better. I've seen my teachers change. I've seen them change how they think about STEAM education. I had one a while ago just told me, I wish we could get further into it. So can we adopt this curriculum as our state a, a curriculum? So we want stuff like this that are more interactive. The brightest, best moment of that was when the Japanese artist, when he was playing the ghost flute, I think the sound really spoke to me because the resonating slow notes, it made me feel at peace with the world. I'm reading a book about Mother Teresa and she lived it. She went to India to live there for a little bit. I finally just figured that out. I hope it grows to where this is something that every school is going to want to put in, in place. I would like to have it replace our current social science curriculum. Is that terrible to say that? I love it. Okay, scratch that. <laughs> scratch that. I just love it so much. I think we should be teaching like this all the time. Kids are going to learn three countries a year and then next year they're going to move up and in fourth grade and they're going to learn another three countries and then fifth grade another three countries so by then they'll have learned nine countries in elementary. It's helping students learn how to be around others and not just the word tolerance but acceptance and being able, the word used earlier was compassionate about the differences going on and thinking on a global level and getting students to think bigger than their little world. It would build compassion not like Martin Luther King said you do not want to segregate like you don't segregate. So that, that's basically separation based on race. So this is basically race and culture. So if you separate based on culture, if you listen to this, you can understand that these people have feelings too. 
They are not demons, they are humans. I must show compassion, they can become my friends. We thank our Sprouts partners at the University of Texas and UT Health for their work on studying the academic and emotional impact of this program, as well as our curriculum writers and the entire Kids to Concerts team.